Okay, so um, this is kind of a climactic moment a little bit. Um, how, how does this relate to teaching and learning? Let's, let's look at that first. Um, the difference between knowledge and true opinion. Well, look, Socrates could have just answered the slave boy's question for him and said, look, you draw the square on the diagonal. That's how you do it. Why did he put him through that? It, um, put, you know, why did he make him work, you know, work through the whole problem? He could have just said, that's it. That's the answer. By the way, he could have said the same thing to Mino when Mino asked, can virtue be taught? He could have said, sure, and just told him. Um, but that probably wouldn't, would have been ineffective the slave boy would not have known why. That is the answer. He would have known that it's the answer. He would have had a true opinion. But he would not have knowledge because he wouldn't know why that is the answer. And presumably the same thing with Mino. Um, look, the whole dialogue is Socrates showing Mino how to figure out you know, um, how, how to figure out what virtue is. It's by this methodology. Okay. Um, this is pretty, this is, a, this is a little bit more important than you may think. I mean, I've had so many teachers in my career as a student that just memorize this shit and repeat it and repeat it back to me. I mean, it's, they're not really, telling me why it's the answer. You're just telling me that it's the answer and then I do some tests and that's it. I just repeat back to them what they said. That is not how you teach, okay? According to Plato, there has been a movement in modern teaching about, hey, you gotta get students to uh, work out the answers to the question themselves. And, they, and they're, it's like a new, this is a brand new idea except for Plato came up with it 2,500 years ago. All right, I won't, uh, I won't pursue that anymore. Um, so you have to work out the reason. How do you work out the reason? That's the next question. Um, and you work it out by the dialectic method, basically. You, um, it is this question and answer. Get the student to think through the question themselves by asking the student questions like Socrates does Mino and, and the slave boy. Get the student to think through the question themselves. This is the problem with the, uh, the riddle, the old argument thing. It makes learning sound like I'm the teacher and I'm gonna hand you the answer and you're just gonna have, you're gonna put it in your head. That's not how it works. The student has to reason through the answer themselves. The teacher is only there to prod the student forward and get, and get them thinking in the right way about the answer so that they, they can figure it out themselves. Um, look, for Plato, the dialectic is pretty much the same thing as reason. Dialectic and reasoning are basically the same thing. Um, why does Plato write dialogues? That's an interest, you know, why does he just write like you know, prose like other people? Well, because Plato thinks of the dialectic in this back and forth questioning thing as a, uh, it, it, that's what reasoning looks like. That's what it is. Um, and it doesn't have to be between, you know, different people. It could be just in your own head. You know, you could be thinking through a question and you'd be like, ah, look, I'm gonna transfer. Should I go to UCSC or should I go to San Jose State? And you'd be like, well, UCSC is more prestigious, but San Jose State's less expensive. And you know, you're going back and forth in your mind, weighing the different uh, arguments in favor of one or the other. That's, that's kind of what's happening between the characters in one of Plato's dialogues. Same kind of thing. You're weighing the, uh, the reasoning and the reasons and the evidence for things back and forth. Um, that is what reasoning is. 
I mean, Plato is trying to show what reasoning is. And Socrates is trying to show Mino how you teach virtue. All right, look, uh, this, this, to take this to another level, that is what philosophy is. Um, you know, a, philosophy is not really a subject matter, it's a methodology. There's philosophical questions in pretty much every subject you can imagine. It's not a subject, it's a way of dealing with questions that cannot be answered. Or have not, let me rephrase that. Questions that have not been answered. How do you deal with questions that are not answered? And the way to do it is to present the best evidence you can on the various sides of, uh, of the question um, and see which one holds the most promise. Who, to quote Socrates from the, or Plato, actually, from the Gorgias, the truth is never refuted. The truth is never refuted. So you, you propose, you, you put forth reasons and arguments and whatever stands up to criticism, the truth is never refuted. That is your answer. It may not be conclusive and it is a moving target. That, um, you know, I'm, acknowledge that. I, it's, it's absolutely true. It's, it, philosophers deal with some uncertainty because um, it may not be refuted now, but it may be refuted by someone in the future. But you're still, you're, the idea is you just keep pressing and pressing until you get the best answer you can. And hopefully you land on the right answer. Every subject in the world was philosophy at one time, and we have found the right answer for a lot of things, you know, um, especially the hard sciences. And, but Newton was a, considered himself a philosopher. He was a natural philosopher. This methodology has really proved itself through the ages. And, um, and it still does, I mean, see, you see, I mean, look, people say this, say there is no right answer about ethics or this or that. That doesn't mean there never will be. And you always strive to get the best answer based on the reasons and the evidence that you have at the moment and that's and that that's what pushes knowledge forward. That is that is what philosophy is. Period. It's not a subject. It's a method, and that's the method it is. You use this dialectic method, the Socratic method, to examine questions. It's not a debate, as I mentioned earlier you seek the answer with the best reasons that you have at your disposal at, at your disposal at the time until you find the right answer by the way i, sh I also would like to mention that um, essentially what plato is saying about knowledge here is that it's justified true belief that is true belief that's justified by reasoning and that is, even today, uh, the most widely accepted answer. If you, you know, if you look at the contemporary philosophers, that's what is knowledge. Most of them will say it's justified true belief. There's a lot of different interpretations of how that come, you know, what that actually entails, what that means, but, but they, they, that is a general consensus. Okay, all right, all right. All right, let's finish the last bit of the dialogue. Um, so uh, Socrates says, some men um, are good by right opinion and others have knowledge. By the way, he says others have knowledge, so it's not just right opinion. And he says, the former seem to be the guide in public life. That is, whenever you run into a politician that's a good person, <laughs> 
they just happen to stumble on the right opinion, the, the true belief, the right answer. They don't really have knowledge. He says maybe it's some kind of divine inspiration that they that they managed to come up with the right answer because they don't really have knowledge. And then he says, one with knowledge about virtue and and um, these other concepts of justice and, and morality would be like a reality among shadows. That's a good um, allusion to, to the uh, myth of the cave, which we're going to talk about next. Look, at the end of this thing, and I've, this is another thing that I just bothers the hell out of me about this um, people in, that interpret this again they just follow, follow the literal things that are said in the dialogue and at the end of this you get to there are no teachers and no students so virtue can't be taught that's the last word in the matter but that's obviously not the point look Wait a minute. Um, how, how, look, again, how stupid can you be? Who did Socrates list as potential teachers of virtue? The sophists, okay, forebearers, poets, maybe even politicians. Who is left out of this conversation so far? What about, <laughs> what about philosophers? What about himself? What about philosophers? Where are they? Well, they're obviously implicitly who Plato is saying are the teachers. Socrates himself in this dialogue is the teacher. He doesn't come out and say, hey, I'm the teacher. Well, yeah, of course. He doesn't come out. Who are the teachers of virtue? He doesn't say, me! No, he doesn't say that, but you're, you're supposed to know that. I mean, you're supposed to realize that that's the point of this. And when he says at the end, now that I have taught you this, go teach it to Anitis, that's your signal that, hey, clearly, the teacher is Socrates. He's the teacher of virtue. And how do you teach virtue? Well, this way, by the dialectic method. All right. Um, maybe I should probably not belabor these points too much. Um, I hope, hopefully, you're uh, getting getting my meaning and Plato's meaning actually. Um, 